Are we, are we happy? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, it is such an honour to be here with you today. It is a real privilege. It's, I'm excited and it's so wonderful to see you all, um, all in the same place and um, in such a beautiful, inspiring surroundings. We were just saying, weren't we, that this is such a beautiful... Um, it, we feel creative even just being here. So thank you very much for having us and thank you everyone for being here. Um, <coughs> just, just to introduce myself, um, as Rufa said, I'm, I'm Ruth Morgan. I'm a professor of crime and forensic science at University College London in the UK. I look after forensic science there, but I also um, act as a vice dean for interdisciplinarity in our faculty of engineering. So I work to help engineers think across more broadly um, across the engineering space, but also beyond, um, which has a lot of um, exciting parts to it. Um, we think a lot about how we can bring engineering into um, into, into discourse with the arts and humanities and the social sciences and how can we really make breakthroughs as we cross those disciplines. And a really key thing about that is creating the space for that to happen. And that's not something that happens um, particularly naturally um, often in our institutions. So going after that and seeing how we can cross disciplines but also then make that bridge between the academy and the real world and really connect the amazing science and technology approaches that are coming out of a university setting and engage how they can really make a difference and contribute to the world being a better place. So that's, um, that, that's a brief overview of me. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome Ilan. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, Ilan is the director of the Elsevier Foundation. And she's also the vice president for corporate responsibility. Um, and she's also co-chair for the Elsevier Foundation's uh, equality. It's, well, it's, task it's force. Elsevier's gender Elsevier's. equity task force. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have an incredible um, person here who has a, such a wealth of experience and beyond publishing as well. You've you've had a number of very interesting roles on your journey, haven't you? So I'm uh, really thrilled to be able to have a chat today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those very kind words of, of introduction. It's um, it's really wonderful to be here. And uh, when we started talking with Zarifa, um, I. You know, it was, there really was really no question about the, the match for the Elsevier Foundation. Um, so, you know, our first, our, our, you know, our, our initial impulse was always yes. And I think I, I want to underscore our areas of work are inclusive research and inclusive health. That we, we work in partnerships. So we, um, we have partnerships, but we also like to fund in partnerships, so we like to work together with other funders, and so it's just, it's exciting to collaborate to support this important initiative. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if it's helpful just to describe a little bit my two hats. That was going to be my first question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank well, you. because, so, um, I'm the director of the Elsevier Foundation. We have about 25 partnerships. We have about $1.5 million, so it's not Bill and Melinda Gates. It's not the Robert Bosch Foundation. <laughs> but what it is, is very, very targeted. So what we can often do is provide that proof of concept seed funding, if you will, so that organizations can then go off and get matching funding. Look, we got this, you know. Um, and to get the ball rolling. And um, let me think, we, um, we've been going for 17 years now. And we started off with calls for grants, where you get, you, know, you get bombarded with hundreds of grants, and you have to sift through all of them. And we, one of these areas was early career researchers. We called it new scholars. And we learned a lot. And we funded things like child care for professional conferences and dual career retention. We funded a program that Elizabeth Pollitzer had on helping early career researchers navigate the, the research landscape so that they don't vote with their feet, but they know their choices and can be conscious about it. So many different concepts and ideas. And after about 10 years, we thought uh, there was the launch of the UN SDGs. And we felt we needed to be more purposeful. And so we started to work in a much more partnership-driven way. So for instance, um, just I'm picking on you, Elizabeth. I hope you don't mind. You'll hear from Elizabeth tomorrow morning. Um, so Elizabeth is the, the founder of the Gender Summits and uh, the director of Portia. But w one of the things we supported for her was helping her take this concept of the Gender Summits, which is an action platform to bring together all the different sectors to talk about advancing women in science, but also sex and gender in research. Um, 
was helping her expand this to developing countries. So our grant through the foundation was kind of was you know it was a again not a huge amount but enough to really help her go out um, to work with uh, funding organizations in Africa, in Asia, and set up a series of gender summits, co-convene them. Anyway, it gives you an idea that partnership, being partnership-driven lets you be much more agile. Um, and so um, one of the things, I just want to share one of the awards we've done for years. I was talking with Marianne a little earlier. Um, about our uh, partnership 10 years now with the Organization for Women in Science for the Developing World. I was also telling Paula about it last night. And we have awards um, that celebrate uh, researchers, women scientists from developing countries for their, their talent. And, and I always see it as a pathway to the UNESCO L'Oreal Awards. It's really, what it does is uh, it, it really just opens those windows, those doors, those opportunities. It helps to spotlight. We take them to the AAAS. We, you know, we, we train them in communications, and we go to their embassies and tell their ambassadors about the great stuff they're doing. We train them in media, uh, how, to, you know, how, to, how to pitch, how to profile, how to present. We do networking, you know, the whole thing. And um, the prize isn't huge. It's 5,000, but it's enough to just sometimes just help someone be that much more visible so that they will be chosen for programs like this, for the L'Oreal Awards, for uh, new, you know, promotions, you name it. Um, so one of the things that I've had the great pleasure is curating over the years programs like this. Um, and one of the things I want to kind of highlight is that the learnings, the, the, the things I've learned within the foundation, I've been able to carry over to Elsevier. So, Elsevier is the, the funder of the foundation. The foundation is a separate board. It's you know, completely independent. But um, I have a hat within Elsevier as well. So it's a, it's, a, it's a corporate responsibility, sustainability hat. And what I've been able to do through the foundation, all the things we've learned from our many partnerships, is pull that into the organization. And Elsevier um, is, is, a, is a curator of research, so a publisher, but also um, they provide analytics, so analytics to understand what's happening in the world of research. They, their goal is, you know, is to make researchers, but also engineers and um, doctors and nurses as productive as possible with, with um, a lot of their, their, um, their tools. So it's not just content, it's also being able to drill into the content in the right way. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Um, so um, I've always felt that Elsevier has a big responsibility as, let's say, a curator of research to get it right. Um, and so what I did with a colleague, Holly Falk Krasinski, who spearheaded uh, basically a gender reports, looking at the body of indexed research and being able to show what are men doing, what are women doing in terms of output, citation. She developed this whole methodology. Um, she uh, brought it to one of the gender summits uh, seven years ago in, uh, in Berlin and shared the methodology, got, it was a consultation, got feedback from the community, and over the last seven years has continued to, to evolve it. And we just had that we had the 2020 gender report, which I would encourage you all to read. But so with, with Holly, who's this incredible scientific brain, um, we launched the Gender Equity Task Force. And we came with like five things. You know, wh what about conference speakers? Because um, elsewhere has 50 scientific conferences. Um, you know, what about the gender balance there? Because this is a place where, where people profile themselves. They grow their careers. It's really important to have these opportunities. We, um, Imka, you were just talking about falling walls. These are incredibly important opportunities for visibility. What are we doing about it to make it more equitable? Um, what about editorial board diversity? Gender balance, um, to start there. Uh, what are the pathways? What are the, you know, what, so we put forward a whole series of things in our, um, the head of the Elsevier Journals at the time said, this is great. Here are three more things. And what we got was about um, four or five years of really passionate grassroots efforts. You know, it was, it was appreciated. It was tolerated, depending on the manager. We made headway. We raised awareness. We had the gender reports, which, you know, helped to kind of show it helped it, it provided a, a way to be in dialogue and to raise awareness internally externally but it really wasn't until we got a female ceo who um, spoke at falling walls on a panel that zarifa organized 
whom saw Bayezid, not till she came on board did we have to stop proving why this was important, why we needed to boost speakers at conferences from 15% to, you know, I think we're now at 39%, so that's invited speakers. We're getting, why we needed to work on editorial boards. We went from 13%, um, I think, in 2014. You know, when you really start to look at these things, it's so shocking, to um, 28. So if you take the Lancet and the journals and the Cell and the rest of Elsevier, there's something like 2,800 journals, so it's, it's up to 28%. So not where it needs to be, but we've made progress. And Kumsal, she was, you didn't have to prove it to her. You didn't have to you know, beg her to go and speak at a gender summit. Yet she, one of the first things she did was to set up an uh, inclusion and diversity advisory board, which has 10 amazing uh, experts, people like Elizabeth, um, people like Londa Schiebinger, who was on the panel um, from the University of Stanford, who really help to put gendered innovations on the map, and I think you'll be hearing a lot more about that. Um, experts like this who've then basically taken what we're doing in the Gender Equity Task Force and put that pressure on from the institution, the accountability, the transparency, and all of a sudden a lot of doors open. You know, the things like, the things that are really difficult are not, it's not creating the goodwill, it's not, it, it's, Things like, how do you put new data fields in you know, systems? So you get the developers, that the, there's money to do that, and the time and the resources, and it's not always at the bottom of the agenda. Oh yeah, the gender thing. That it's really embedded. Um, so we just um, created a, a report of the last two years of work. So I, I'd love to share that with all of you, but it's like a report card. It's like, you know, what's happening with, for instance, sex and gender in research, which I'm sure Elizabeth will be, you'll be talking about. Um, you know, what is Elsevier doing to raise awareness? Uh, what about how data is collected, so self-reported data? How can we create a gender schema that is adopted by everyone, by everyone, publishers, researchers, that everyone feels comfortable with? What about race and ethnicity that cuts across countries and cultures? How can we do this in a way that's not, you know, that it's going to work for, for different organizations, for researchers themselves. And so th this is a, a report which really tries to tackle three areas. Career progression, which is where um, our support for this program comes in, and our many other initiatives we have for early career researchers. Um, I get passionate talking about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so career progression, sex and gender and research, and then participation in the research ecosystem. So editorial boards and things like this. I'm sorry, this is turning into a monologue, Ruth. I, no, well, I, no, I don't want to stop you because this is always just, I mean, when, when we first had our first chat, I came away and I was just on the ceiling. I was so excited because all the things that you were talking about. And I guess one of the things that, so you mentioned Londa driving it. And amazing. She has this amazing sort of framework, if you like, yep. doesn't she, about the importance of um, inc incorporating gen sex and gender into, into things. and. Um, and I'm aware that m people in this room will know this much better than me, but from what I've read of her work, it's, she has this real insight, which is we need to fix the numbers. So we need to ensure that women are actually present. Um, we need to um, fix the institutions. So we actually need to create infrastructure and pathways so that women can actively progress and, and contribute. Um, but we also need to fix the knowledge. Yeah. And it's not just about having women Present, but it's also about including the diversity of the world in our research, so that the research is excellent. And I guess what you're really, um, what, what you've just been sharing is about, it's about fixing numbers, but it's also about fixing institutions. And what I'm really encouraged and excited by when you talk about what you've done is that you're such an inspiration because you, had, you, saw, you saw the need and yet there wasn't anyone going, yes, please do that. And yet you carried on. And now we're in a situation where, as you say, there's a, a CEO who's willing to go and champion these things. You have an established board. So just could you share with us a little bit? You know, what, is it that you, what is it that got you to have that grit <laughs> that has meant that we're now in a position where I would argue things are looking so much more positive and, and bright than maybe even five years ago? Yeah. 
I think, so I just want to say first time, you probably, you may have noticed this, I don't know, it's kind of interesting, but I'm not a scientist. I, I'm really from the humanities side. You may have noticed it in how I express myself or how, um, I'm really about stories and storytelling. And so I, I think the, the first year, so I've worked on the foundation since 2008, talking to a lot of the, the, the people who received grants from us, getting a deeper understanding of the issues, the frustrations, the invisibility, um, I think it just, uh, yeah, it, it just has stayed with me, and I've built on that foundation, and I've carried it back to, um, to, to colleagues. And <clears throat> I am ten tenacious, so I, I grew up moving every two years, and I, I think uh, it gives you qualities like you, you have to be open to new things, you have to be able to connect, uh, but you, you have to have a strong core or it's, it's absolutely shattering, I think. Um, I had a, a male manager probably three or four years into uh, the gender equity task force work. And it was a lot of work because we were running um, different work streams in these different areas, trying to understand where we could make a difference. I was you know, running these quarterly meetings with like 40 people, chairing them, um, trying to pull it into real returns where there was a kind of uh, tolerance, but also apathy. And my manager said, uh, from Elsevier, you know, was just like, well, why don't you just, you know, just, it's taking too much of your time. Just, you know, let it go. And I'm really happy that we, you know, we, Holly and I, and we inspired each other. And Holly is an amazing person. And, and um, you know, we really instigate. I think the, the other thing is that I, I credit Elizabeth Pollitzer with the Gender Summit. So this is, these, are, these are these spaces where I think one of the first ones, the very first one that you had in 2011, um, I, I believe Londa was there, or the next one. And you know, so you're meeting these kinds of people. You're learning from them. You're meeting experts that Elizabeth, Londa, others are working with on the sex and gender issue. You know, you're, it's helping to flesh out and establish these areas. And you realize you're not alone. That sounds really silly, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, there are a lot of different people fighting and trying to explore this. Um, and I want to highlight something, that what you're seeing sometimes is these ideas coming of age. So uh, one of the IND advisory board members is Tom Welton, who's the president of the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK, and uh, the chair of the chemistry department at Imperial College London. And he uh, set up a... Um, the joint commitment to action in IND and publishing a year ago, is it? But basically, this has helped to bring together all the publishers. And it's created a non-competitive space where things like the, the gender and race and ethnicity schema are shared and have been adopted by 50 publishers, scientific publishers, who are going to work on this together. Um, and there are a whole other series of areas. There's a whole kind of 10-point charter that they're uh, espousing, and I think that's really cool. That's when you can start to make a difference. One thing that was really interesting is there were dialogues between funders, and then I'm talking about you know real research funders like the DFG, big big ones, and um, and publishers about uh, trying to establish this gender and race ethnicity across. And it's 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 tricky because funders are thinking nationally. They're they're not or regionally, the European Commission. They're not um, thinking discipline-wide or challenge-wide, usually. Um, so it, it was a really interesting exploration, but it also kind of ended up with a, a space of, well, we need to, to talk further. This is, you know, that wasn't entirely compatible, the vision, but, but that's all right. This is, you know, the main thing is that these different groups are talking and trying to make progress in areas because it's about measuring, right? It's about the ben baselines and shedding light. And I think that's what we've been trying to do uh, within our organization, but also in the sector. Uh, and I see the foundation as a kind of a way to push and to keep the pressure on. Mm -hmm. But it may, it's a lot easier when you have uh, people from your rich network, experts like Elizabeth, um, like Tom Welton, uh, that are helping your organization to, and sector to move in the right direction. You know, like-minded people. <laughs> I heard recently that your vibe will attract your tribe. Oh, and that's nice. I think that's nice. a really nice way of putting this. 
um, you put the good energy out there and you find the people who are who see it too and, and you work together and I think what's so so inspiring about that is and I don't know about your experience in the science world um, my experience can be that often there's a lot of competition and actually that competition is quite divisive and people sort of aim to protect their area rather than seeing that someone else is doing something that's aligned or that could be aligned and actually actively seeking to go and work together and I think your story just there is just really powerful that this isn't something that one institution or one individual can achieve on their own but working collaboratively and persisting <laughs> even when things maybe don't look as promising yes yeah. is how it works I wanted to um highlight something about the work to, to increase editorial board diversity, mm. conference speaker diversity, that we decided early on, and we have a head of, head of conferences at Elsevier is, is married to a scientist, a woman scientist, and he just, we never had to explain anything to him. He just totally got it. But we decided um, that it had to be engagement driven. So with the chairs of the conferences who are usually editors of journals, it had to be, um, evidence-driven and engagement-driven. So show them the numbers. That's why the gender reports are so important that you can say, in your discipline, you have this percentage of women, but you only have this percentage of speakers at your conference. Um, you know, what can we do about this? And so it's really, it's very much about including them, about um, working with them to create lists of, of uh, you know, these amazing, you were talking about this before, so that you have the choice. Uh, and so it's been a whole process, it's been a whole journey. So we've seen, for instance, with the conference speakers, it's a very neat um, kind of subject. Since you're talking about 50 conferences, you're talking about you know, seven years. You're, it's not such a, a vast thing like 2,800 journals. You're, uh, but you see the progress slowly but incrementally going up. Um, and the other thing is when there was the pandemic, by its nature, going virtual was much more inclusive. So all of a sudden, it was much easier to have um, people who had very busy lives, juggling many different things, women scientists, uh, coming in as speakers, but also speakers from developing countries. And so the, the whole conference mix was much more, much more balanced. Um, then in terms of the journals, it's been actually a massive enterprise because <laughs> You, you can reach the, the publishers who, who work with the editors. So the publishers are then Elsevier, they work for Elsevier. And you get the publishers who believe passionately in this, care. A lot of women, but also men, um, she for he, you know, <laughs> who, who then just start, started on their own when we were doing this in a grassroots way, engaging with their editors and, you know, show, developing those percentages, the mapping of the field with the, and the lists. and. That, those went by themselves, and they were also asked to kind of um, manually map the gender of their editors so we could track this. So, I mean, um, with Kumsal, our, our female CEO, coming in, you know, all of a sudden we got resources. It became part of people's jobs. Uh, it became embedded, and it was uh, in everybody's development card they had, or development sort of you know, profile within the organization, they had to show how they had contributed to IND in the past year. So if you, you know, want to move ahead with your career, you have to do this, you have to show. And it just, it made a huge difference. And we started getting also um, male publishers uh, taking this on as a, as a secondment. Um, you know, and, and, and we had the whole support to add the gender field, you know, and, and we're moving to self-identification, of course, because that's much better, because you, you want to have things open for um, man, woman, non-binary, other, so important. Um, yeah, so it's, it's been, uh, it's, it's really been fascinating, but I just wanted to mention that the evidence, the analytics is important, the data, to always be data-driven, and the, the engagement, so no quotas. Although we're really pushing to get there, but um, we were afraid that quotas would uh, alienate some of the, the editors, and I think that's a whole debate unto itself. But I'll be talk about more in the next two days. <laughs> For sure, um, and I'm interested by that evidence-driven approach and data-driven approach because obviously we're scientists. That's something that is quite innate, and yet this is a this is quite a diverse and complex world and, um, and, and situation. So I'm just thinking, like, could you give us some your top tips of, of those who are 
looking at if that's the landscape, how do you get onto those lists? How do you sort of show the numbers, if you like, in your career so that you're able to get more visibility and more voice? That's a tough question. Mm. I'm not <laughs> sure if I'm the right person to answer that. I, um, but just from what you've seen yeah. in terms of how those lists are put together and what it is that people are looking for. I think, um, I know that some of our publishers are experimenting with kind of pathways to being an editor so that they have kind of assistant editor positions for more early career researchers. But that's kind of, you know, a way to, to add to your... Mm. And presumably being, having a good network to be able to hear about those opportunities yes. in your field. Yes, yes. Um, I know with, with reviewing that more and more publishers are trying to make sure people get credit for what they're doing. So their schemes, and it's of course that honor system and critical to stay abreast in your, of your field, uh, but also very time consuming and reviewers are unsung heroes. Um, so it's, but, but more and more you can show, there's certain, mm. there are ways to, to show that you're a steady contributor. But I, I, um, I think also speaking at conferences taking part in you know, applying. All of you took the time to apply for this program. Uh, we watched many of your videos when we were, we were on the selection committee, and uh, you know, fantastic stories you were telling. And I recognize many of you from having seen those. You took the time to do this, and it's, it's time consuming, these kinds of things. But you know, by taking those steps, you're making yourself visible. Mm. Uh, you know, I, so I think it's, it's also stepping forward I was going to say leaning in, but that's so contested. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, and I just want to say something that I, uh, within Elsevier, I, I recently received my promotion to vice president of, of corporate responsibility, which is also that gender advisor role. But also, I do a lot of work with developing countries. And um, if I think of the trajectory of my career, it's not been, um, it's been very, Meandering. It's taken me a long time to f to find my space, but also to develop those leadership qualities. And I did a lot of it through this grassroots way. You know, just it really bringing people together about <coughs> topics I was passionate about, um, and slowly becoming recognized as a voice. But it, it's also, I think, um, reflects an organization that they recognize the need for someone who who specializes in this kind of collaboration and dialogue and soft, soft power. I, you know, it's not, it's, uh, so I, my point is it's not a, if I think of, tw I've been with Elsevier for 17 years, you know, when I, in the first couple of years I had a manager who, who I admired greatly and she was a director and, and um, she was just saying, I just don't know, I don't know if they'll ever recognize you know, the importance of, of how you work with nonprofits and, and that style of working and the collaboration, and you should go look somewhere else. And um, so I, I also see it as a, a, f a function of uh, the, the, the growth within an organization to recognize the need for this kind of work. And I think the SDGs, you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, they have that SDG 17 for a reason. And it's, it's helped to elevate the status of, of being able to work with others. I'm putting it very <laughs> simply, but that's what it is. Yes. It's the give and take and being able to create this mutually beneficial space where you can both flourish or all flourish. Anyway, so um, I, I think it's very interesting when a culture evolves enough to recognize the need for something. And, and also sticking to your gut by the yes. sounds of it, in that by the sounds of it, you could have taken a, made a choice to go in a, in a different direction, which was perhaps more conventional, more recognized in terms of the skills that you could have gained, and yet you stuck to your gut in terms of what you felt your gifts were and what you enjoyed doing, and you flourished, but you've had to make a pathway yourself. Is so, that Yes, no, fair? that's absolutely yeah. right. I also, you know, there was also a push to try to go more for people. I was being pushed into more commercial spaces when I was, um, you know, 10 years ago, and I just, I couldn't relate to it. I really couldn't relate to it. Why would I, you know, that's great for other people. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing a lot of your stories. And last night over dinner, we heard some, some of the move, the videos you sent in, I, I saw it. It's, it's really that passion that shines through. Um, 
Paola, you were talking about uh, you know how much how interested you were in, in biology and how dissuaded you were growing up, like oh you'll just be a teacher, and, but that ultimately you found your way back to the subject you've always been so interested in, and of course evolved greatly in that. But um, so yeah, I think that's what this is about. It's really, and perhaps I, I was old enough that I just I couldn't not follow my gut because I knew that I would probably burn out or just be terribly unhappy and depressed if I if I didn't do something I really cared about? <laughs> I think probably you've got a lot of people with you at that yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. um, I certainly very much resonate with that. Um, th things can be really tough, can't they? Um, but if you believe in what you're doing, that carries you over the, the hurdles and the humps and the <laughs> in the road. And um, that, that belief that ultimately achieving those goals will make things better is, is a very powerful sort of... Well, I don't, yeah, adrenaline, I suppose, that gets you through. Yeah. I also wanted to mention something else, that um, there's also that need to, to let go at some point. When, when uh, uh, an area has really taken off and it's being professionalized mm. and you need many types of minds to move, I, I really would call it like a movement within an organization, to move it forward. Um, in this case, inclusive research. Uh, and so it's also important to, to let go um, and, and not to want to keep it for yourself. So, for instance, just a lot of the people working in work streams in this gender equity task force have been professionalized and they're highly specialized on, you know, all forms of peer review or data science or you name it, you know, and there are many other experts to be consulted now and that's great. And I... Um, I'm always a generalist, you know, so it's, it's, so I feel what I can do is tell the story of the, the narrative and, of course, these wonderful partnerships like the Falling Walls um, Female Leadership Talent Program. We're working in, in Singapore with uh, a similar type of kind of workshop, but then very much geared towards what uh, women scientists in Singapore feel they need. So it's much more about that commercialization a lot about pitching to journalists. That may all come to pass and here as well. And, and, but um, we're, we're, we have many different initiatives going on. And we received extra funding from, from Elsevier to launch a whole new early career researcher portfolio because there is that backing. Um, but do you know what I mean about l letting go? That mm. it's just important not to try and hold something tight, like, oh, this is my space, you know, my territory. I, you know. And being able to see the gifts that others have and the, the, the ways that they see things that are different to you yeah. and being able to celebrate that <coughs> and see that collectively we're so much more able to speak to a, a topic or make progress on a topic than if there's just a single lens, which is a very, you know, can be a, a real visionary lens, but generally speaking, we're in very complex spaces, aren't we? And actually having that diversity of views and collaboratively pooling those resources yeah. gets us further. I, I wanted to mention something that um, one of the things that I found quite difficult when I first started working for Elsevier is that it felt very male and corporate mm. and commercial, which it was. And I, I remember at one point um, we had our foundation board meeting in Philadelphia. This was about five years ago. And um, it was timed at the same time as an Elsevier management team meeting. And I was standing there with um, Dr. Jerry Richmond, who was the president of the AAAS at one point from, from the University of Oregon, uh, and an envoy for, for Obama Science Envoy, amazing woman. And all we're waiting, we're waiting to, um, we're kind of meeting, meeting up to take a picture of the, board, of the foundation board. And all of a sudden, the Elsevier management board, some of whom are on the foundation board as ex officio members, start pouring out of this room. It must have been like 15 men and two women. And she was just outraged. And we had the foundation dinner that night, and she just she went after the CEO. The, the, you know, like, what? <laughs> and I think what I, what I wanted to say about this is that in the last few years, our current CEO has changed the culture at the top. And um, I think, I forget the exact percentage, but we have amazing leaders there. And it's like the women leaders. There's much more balance. I don't think it's 50%, but it might be 40. It's really, 
it's close. And what you see then is that the, the mood changes. There's, it feels so much more inclusive. I no longer feel that I'm somehow wrong when I, I mean, this is a while ago, 50, you know, 10, when I would speak up in a meeting that you just feel like by very, by, by just by being a woman and expressing yourself in a way that's different, you feel off. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have felt this um, in the worlds that you, you maneuver in over the years, but it's, it's a wonderful thing to experience this kind of uh, lessening of that feeling, this feeling like everybody's important. And of course, I'm sure there's still pockets of, we have to really work very, very hard. But I, this is something I wanted to note, that when Kumsol joined, she hired, one of the first things she did was hire a, a DNI officer, right? This is very typical with organizations, a good thing. And one of the first things that he did was to say, let's not call it diversity and inclusion. Let's, call, let's start with inclusion, because you can do diversity. You can hire. You can, but it's all going to fall apart very quickly. And you'll have a lot of disenfranchised and unhappy people uh, who feel that they've been replaced. <laughs> um, so we need to start with making sure that with this whole idea of inclusion and this culture of inclusion, that all voices are welcome. And it will flow from there. And so that's been kind of the big shift uh, in the organization's inclusion, mm. you know, and, and making sure people are heard and not left out. And it's a work in progress, right, in any organization. But I just wanted to make that point. Mm. And it sounds like the conversations are happening. They are. In a way that maybe they weren't before. And conversation is a really powerful, powerful thing, isn't it, in terms of just that gradual, ongoing, rubbing shoulders, side by side journeying together that really does actually change, change the story, I guess, if, if, if you're with people who are willing to contribute and be part of that. Definitely. That's so Ruth, you're an editor of a journal, right? I've just stepped down, but I yes. Just, so <laughs> it's also interesting, because I mean, I, I, I'm sure you're, you know, you, you're aware, you think of things like editorial board appointments, as a career path, as, a, as an important kind of thing for your CV and for your growth and to show that you're a leader and an expert. But I mean, how, how did that work over the years? I mean, it's very generally asked, but you know what I'm saying about in terms of trying to make sure there was some gender balance? Was this on the radar with the publisher you worked with or? So, so, so yes, um, but I'm also working in a field where there's an awful lot of women. Um, so in forensic science, our, so, for example, our master's program is often 90% women. Um, so, often the engineering faculty are quite pleased about that because we, we're quite helpful for their, for their numbers. Um, but, and so, in, in, in the journal I was, I was working with, um, we, we had a very good sort of balanced set of contributing authors um, because there is a fairly diverse population. I think what we I think, I think the biggest challenge we had was more about geographical diversity and really trying to make it um, more yeah. accessible for those that are not from the traditional three major you know, <laughs> countries that are, are really um, supporting and, and, and funding forensic science. So that, that was something that um, I, we, we were thinking about, we were looking at, um, and there's definitely a, lo a long way to go. I mean, I don't know about your experience of, of the pandemic, but mine has certainly been that with things going online, with more digital, hybridised ways of interconnecting, that my circle has grown. And the voices that I, I get to engage with and to hear from is so much more diverse than it ever was before. Yeah. And I am so, so hopeful that we don't go completely back to the way it was before, because the richness that you get and, and just just in terms of realising that you are in a bubble. However broad-minded you think you are, however diverse your group is, you do have a particular way of thinking and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a story that has got you to the way you are that frames how you see the world. And being side-by-side <coughs> side people who have a different story opens up possibilities. And I, I guess some of the most exciting things I'm thinking about right now, I didn't even realise I'd be thinking about two years ago because of the people that I've been able to talk to. Um, so one of the, um, the forums that I work with is World Economic Forum and their scientist community. And just 
sitting down and talking to scientists who are working in China, sitting down and talking to those that are working in Chile, their worlds are different and their struggles are different and their visions are, are different. And yet, with all that diversity, there's a core that is very much the same. Like, we are all deeply concerned about doing fantastic science that will address real world problems and change the world for the better. So that diversity is inspiring, but it also makes you realise that working together, actually you, the agency that you can have is powerful because you've got more facets to your diamond, if you like, <laughs> rather yeah. than a, and a, sing, a, a single prism, maybe. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think that's my biggest hope for the future, that we continue to draw on those capabilities that we've we've got. I mean, I, what, what's your take on that? Do you think oh, we've got? Yeah. I, I think it's hugely important. I just wrote an article. Um, mm, of course. I gave a presentation in January for the Academic Publishers Europe. It was it was virtual. Mm. It was supposed to be here in Berlin, okay. um, and it was about the Global South and, and IND. Because um, so on the panel there was also uh, someone from the Royal Society of Chemistry talking about the joint commitment and all the strides that they and 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 uh, others like elsewhere have made in um, gender. And so my my role was to bring forth the, the, the piece on the Global South. So through the foundation, we've you know we've had have so many partnerships in in lower income countries. Um, our, one of the first grant programs we had, you know, for 10 years when we were giving out grants, they were for libraries in developing countries. Um, and I'm also the chair of the Research for Life Executive Council. And Research for Life basically provides access to researchers from developing countries. And there's something like 170 publishers involved, five UN agencies. Uh, so it's all about access, but they're shifting to not just access, but to capacity building. By that I mean, uh, it's from seeing researchers in developing countries not just as consumers of knowledge, but producers of knowledge. And this, this seems so basic, but it is not the way that program was designed. It was very north to south. Here you go, you know, <laughs> enjoy the research. But you know, it's, it's not about that. It's about creating a more inc inclusive research ecosystem for everyone. Mm. And so the, the, um, just wrote a, a paper based on what I'd presented, and it was a call for uh, publishers to come together, like they are for gender, with a joint commitment, to all, and, and to really come and get organized around things like uh, APC waivers and editorial board commitments. And um, I want to also note that when the IND Advisory Board was formed at Elsevier, one the, it started with gender. It's gender. And very quickly, Elizabeth and the other members said, you know, you need to think about race and ethnicity. You need to think about geographic diversity. But it is a little bit of a, a, a standpoint of first this really important subject of gender. Um, but much work needs to be done. And I think with editorial mm. boards, it's just essential. Otherwise, you know, you could have gender balance, but it might all be Oxbridge, for instance. <laughs> or, um, but so I just, I just want to say that this is an area that I'm very keen to do what I can in, um, you know, to see how we can really do much, much more from, from where we're situated, from the foundation, with our grants and partnerships, but, but also from Elsevier, because Elsevier has that, you know, the, it's a um, content and data and analytics and a convening power. And th those, are, those are powerful things you can put in the struggle, mm. in the fight. <laughs> and I think if we, you know, we were talking about fixing the institutions, and I think what you've just described is so inspiring because it's, Institutions can do a lot, but they need to be working with publishers and with policymakers and, and, and a whole host of different people to actually be able to achieve what it is we're looking to, to achieve. And this idea that there's these different sectors and everyone gets on with it in their own little way, rather than yeah. actually making those connections, crossing those lines and actually doing things coherently Institutions will only change if publishers have changed, for example. It's a, <laughs> a virtuous circle. Yes, yeah, a virtuous say. circle. <laughs> but I, I was going to say, you know, I've been talking about publishers, that's where I'm coming from, but it's really, it, we're nothing without, it's, you know, we're completely part of that. 
ecosystem and mm. we need to contribute do we need to do our part and we need to do our part in an integrated way and that's mm. that's really what I'm we're working together to, about. Yeah, yeah absolutely I'm just this has been so fascinating I just I'm I've hogged you um, <laughs> and I would love to open up the floor because I'm sure there are lots of questions that have um, been mulling in people's minds so um, please <laughs> Thank you, it was really exciting to listen to you. Um, I think that this question might... Yes, my name is Marina and I'm the postdoctoral researcher in the Max Planck Institute for Human Cognitive and Brain Sciences. And I think this question might be interesting for everyone. Um, me, myself, I never uh, imagined myself as an editor, as a full job. Um, as a full-time job, but I think that this could be quite an interesting experience for a researcher just to have it along with your own project. So could you maybe, both of you, uh, could you maybe tell us how to get on this path, how to get this experience? Is there a way to have it um, as an additional volunteering or is it a paid job? How, how does it work at all? Maybe it's interesting first to hear from your experience and then I can add to that. Sure, so I think my, my experience was so attending the meetings, the conferences within my field, um, presenting my work, um, contributing where I could um, in terms of reviewing and building, those, building that idea of how the, the landscape lay in my, in my discipline, who were the sort of the key people and I guess and this is where I'm a bit nervous of saying because my, I think my experience was probably a bit odd and <laughs> I, I seem to say that quite a lot about my career actually um, but um, <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but I, I was actually um, approached by one of the Elsevier portfolio managers who was saying you know in your field forensic science there are these there are a few key journals but there seems to be an awful lot of scope because the, the discipline is growing so much for a range of other titles. So we, we ended up having a chat over coffee and I sort of shared some of my thoughts and where, where, what, what fields might be interesting and where there could be an awful lot of really great research that's not actually getting a, a, a good place within the existing offering. Um, and I guess that, that continued probably over a year, just every so often, you know, oh, I just wondered, what do you think about this? And, um, and then we got to a point where um, he, he had clearly put the business case together and was launching a series of new journals within Forensic Science and I was asked to come on as one of the, the senior editors. So I suppose probably the, the, the part of that story that's pertinent here is always have a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> always have that conversation, even if you're not quite sure where it's going to go or quite what they're after or quite how it might fit in, um, it's often these things that happen months, years later that it, it sort of all comes together. But it's, I'm guessing that isn't yeah, quite I, the norm. I mean, if I think of, um, it's a little different, but it's, you know, in terms of building one's career, it's, it's really been conferences because then you hear amazing speakers and you connect and you, it, it all comes from that, but it, it's a little harder I mean, it's online. It's more inclusive, but you know, you're not having a coffee. No. So it's been, I think, two years of treading water for a lot of a lot of mm. us. Um, and on the fumes of those good connections you had from yeah. before, rather than being able to forge new ones and deepen. Yeah. Absolutely. So for me, it's been very much engagement-driven and asking that question. And um, when I first started to uh, go to conferences. I, you know, it was hard to find my voice. I was really shy. I, I just, you know, so then I would ask afterwards. I'd go up afterwards. And, um, but slowly but surely, you know, you, you, you build your understanding of a, of a topic and you know what you want to ask and why you want to do it. Um, so then it becomes easier to, to ask during a meeting and, you know, just building bit by bit. But you were also asking about the structure of, of being editors, I believe there's an honorarium. It sort of depends per field. Like economics, I believe, was always much more kind of money-driven as a field <laughs> than other areas where there's such a, just a very different approach. Um, so my understanding is that usually editors receive honoraria and 
um, funds to cover costs. Is mm. that your experience? Yes, yes. A, yeah, a small honorarium. Um, I guess the. I'm just yeah. I'm just the other the other thing that's sort of floating in my mind is this idea that when you are when you do get an opportunity to do something within that space, whether it's um, contribute to a special issue or um, maybe even work with somebody on a special issue, perhaps if you do it well, you will get noticed, um, and it's often that 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 can be a way of you know. And when I say do it well, I mean you know, meet deadlines. <laughs> we all know that in the academic world, you know, deadlines are more like guidelines often, aren't they? Um, so, you know, but, but, but you know, doing those things in a way that it, it, you're easy to work with, you're fun to work with, I think that can often also create those pathways for the future as well. Yeah. Well, one of the things, we have a, an awards program um, with Cell, Cell Press founded it a year ago with, um, called Rising Black Scientists. And I think they're, they're also finding that it's hard to run awards because you have to invest, you have to build. So we're, we're going to partner with them and we'll bring extra funds and we'll expand it from life sciences to physical sciences. And one of the, the big aspects of this is that the, the winning um, early career black scientists in these fields will have their, their essay. They have to write an essay published in a, in a cell press journal. Um, and now we're adding material, uh, sorry, uh, physical sciences, so we'll have to add an appropriate journal for that. But those are also door openers. All these things that lead to your visibility, um, where you're, you know, mm. you're, they make a difference. And they, they all contribute to your being asked and mm. you know, for the next thing. I think also responding, uh, maybe in a written form, you know, to, to uh, if there are articles or. Oh, yes, absolutely. In because you, you also worked as a policy advisor. Right? I mean, that's also a whole role where you're highly visible <coughs> and you're translating your research to the policy sphere, which is a u unique <laughs> set of uh, skills in and of itself. But I mean, that's another way where you become visible within your field. Oh, look what she's doing. But, I mean, that, that's maybe an interesting thing to, to share at some point. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because um, I felt like I learned an awful lot more than I gave in, in that role. Um, but I think that's when, it's actually when you go into those settings that you realise that you, you, might, you may feel fairly early or you might feel like you know your bit really well and there's these other bits. But just to a policymaker who's a, who is a generalist, who has huge and deep expertise in, a, in certain areas, but for whom an area of science might be quite, quite on the edge of it, you bring a huge amount of value and a huge amount of insight that to you doesn't seem particularly extraordinary, perhaps. Um, but if you can do that kind of um, translation, if you can see what it is that they're, they need and then work hard at translating it, you suddenly get a voice and you suddenly get people who are able to make decisions and actually change things, understanding core and key topics or themes or... And, and often it's the history. Often, you know, policymakers are incredibly bright, intelligent people. They can read, they can read all of the material, but it's often having that context and understanding, ah, well, this, is the, this is the group that are talking about this because actually over the last 10 years, this is what's happened, which has got us to this point suddenly everything makes sense, but it's, that could be quite um, a, a trick. But yeah, it's, um, again, it's not something that I think everybody needs to be able to do, if it's something that you, d you have a, um, a heart for, then it's definitely worth pursuing and um, doing the hard work to figure out what, what other people's needs and drivers are and how to, <coughs> how to land salient things in powerful ways. It's, it, it's a, yeah, it's another, part, it's another part of being a scientist, isn't it? And I think it's also one that's not often recognised, not often rewarded within our institutional systems. Um, and it's actually, um, I've just, um, with the World Economic Forum scientists, just, we've launched this um, initiative, which is called One Million Scientists in 100 Million Hours. And the idea being that we, if, if you could get one million scientists enabled by their institutions to devote two hours a week, you could create 100 million hours 
for building bridges and engaging with those in policy. And that could potentially really change the game. It could get great science into policy and not just in that, oh my goodness, we've got a disaster, let's wheel in the scientists to tell us what the science says, <laughs> more in that ongoing general way over the months <coughs> and years so that when there is a crisis, that science thinking is infused and it's not a sort of sticking plaster that comes in at the, uh, sort of after the fact. Um, uh, but one of the key things about that is it would need institutional change to, to recognise that as a, as a valuable skill, as a way of demonstrating excellence as a scientist. And it's also not something that everybody would need to do. We don't need yeah. all scientists doing that. Um, we, we need the specialists as well. Yeah, yes. and just to follow that vein, um, I saw that many of you uh, are very, some of you are <coughs> passionate about science communications and doing outreach in your communities. And um, you know, I think that that's similar. It may not be valued in your institution, but it is an incredible contribution. It does make you visible maybe to other, in other ways. Um, but it, it shows that, taking that initiative. Mm. I was also thinking that Hannah, I, where's Hannah? Is Hannah here? <laughs> oh, 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 maybe I got Helena, I'm sorry. Sorry, not Hannah, Helena. <laughs> Helena, you're working on science, communications, health, literacy. Um, it'd be really interesting to hear your thoughts. I mean, you, this is your field, of course. Um, but so it'll be interesting to hear your thoughts on, on this. Mm as well, you know, the importance of, of translating to the public, policy makers and so forth. I'm sorry, Hannah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, because it's my field, we are more um, into what are the barriers and... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Because it's the topic of my research, so I, I think I have another uh, perspective on it. Uh, because um, we we see it more as a problem in science um, and uh, how we can understand it and um, what we can do to make it easier. And in my research, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, the perspective of the individuals, so the public or uh, some groups within the public. Um, but um, the challenges uh, to become visible as a scientist, I think, are the same. Um, so it's um, very, very uh, challenging how, as a scientist, um, we can get more visible um, and um, how we can, we can transfer our knowledge <laughs> or my knowledge that I know um, what are some barriers in science communication or what are some um, barriers uh, when we talk about health literacy. Uh, yes, of course, but to transfer them to, to me as a scientist. But I think, uh, yeah, to be very uh, self-confident is, or to try to be self-confident uh, is one uh, very, one key step, one oh. first step. And, and I think when you, when you are, you also go in with humility because you're in an environment where not everyone has the same experience as you and that's a really magic place to be because that's that's when you can learn isn't it and I, I know my experience certainly has been when I'm speaking about my science in a very diverse external to science setting I, I, I learn so much about how that science is perceived which then feeds back into my research to try and address some of those issues and so, it's, so it's, a, it's a very interesting symbiotic process that can really benefit science. So it's not just that we need people to know stuff, it's we need to hear their perspectives so that we can make sure our work is relevant. And Brilliant. Is there a question here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a bit. <laughs> Thank you. If, if, if we still have time. Yes. Yeah, we do. So I wanted to um, go back to Maria, uh, Marina's question to the editorial, editorial team position. I, I don't know who's <coughs> also confused like me. Um, I wasn't aware this, this is a thing, being on an editorial team. Because now I realize I am actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well done. And I, I, I did realize it's a thing, really, yeah. because it was for me, oh, yeah, it's fun. I do it. Um, 
I was reviewing for a very long time and was like, hey guys, what are you doing there? I want to be part of it. Why do you decide and I just review? And they said, yeah, sure, come in. You are now part of, part of, this, um, of the editorial team. And I, for me, it was like another voluntary work I do. You know, it's, a, it's another voluntary, and now you're highlighting it in a way where I think, so I needed a little bit to digest <laughs> this, to be honest. And so my question would be, first, why am I so stupid not realizing it? <laughs> <laughs> Second, uh, how can I use this now when I know, okay, it's a thing, uh, being recognized, like, okay, otherwise they wouldn't ask me to review that much. And I review also on a, Internet, like the, the, I'm a, on, on an editorial team uh, in um, editorial board in, in a German, very small journal, but but this is the journal in my field or the field I was working in. So um, because I'm one of the like rising stars, some kind of researcher there. So they they took me into the board, but I am also reviewer in an international journal. So. And now when you talk about it, it's like, okay, it's a, it's a thing. I think we, we need to think about it. <laughs> so, so, um, I think there is a distinction between um, reviewing and being asked by an editor to review yeah. and then being on the editorial team or board. And um, I think that's something you can refer to in, in your, you know, I'm on the editorial board of. I, I, uh, I never, I don't even write in my CV. We like, should definitely do that. This is, <laughs> you see? <laughs> This too, as well. <laughs> this should be in your CV. Oh my god, okay. Thank you for that, but again, how can I use it? Like writing in my CV, for example, yeah. and telling you, the story. Okay, yeah. okay, that's good. Okay, girls, you heard? Okay, we should do that, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's, oh, oh. I just wanted to Sorry. comment. Sorry. Oh. I just wanted to comment on this. Uh, there are lots of opportunistic journals are being produced now. I'm continuously invited to be uh, on the editorial team aboard. And I think we really have to look where the invitation is coming from. Because otherwise you get caught up in uh, really doing a lot of work for nothing. Yeah. Um. Thank you. That was the same direction I was going in because um, uh, I was also asking because you told about like be the good citizen, the easy to work with, you know, like be always on the deadline. And I remember I was working for seven years as a historian at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development. And I remember I was always the best citizen. Yeah, I was yeah. I would always meet the deadlines. This is why I would sometimes turn down great invitations oh. because now I have this deadline to meet in two weeks. And I was on so many boards involved internally to make the voices of the, of the female researchers, oh, wow. of the young talents heard, and so on, that I missed a lot of opportunities to step out because I was the good institution in my kind of like immediate surrounding, research surrounding, and um, it wasn't rewarded. So I didn't get a very good salary. I didn't get many opportunities yeah, to be presented outside with what I got. Just when I left, they awarded me with a medal, which was really nice. Um, but um, this really made me question, if, is it always good for the women to be the really good citizen? Because when I edited a book, I realized the men all handed in late. Because they said, I have other conferences to go, I have other important stuff to do. The women were mostly on time. And also the more senior the women got, the one or two days more, you know, like they ask for. And I wondered if we need to change our attitudes also and say like, we can allow ourselves to go for that coffee, to go for that conference, um, and to really say, I don't always need to be, you know, like um, the perfect schoolgirl who hands on everything in time and gets an A plus for what she does. Mm -hmm. And what I also found great when one of my uh, colleagues said, and you know what, I'm not the best researcher in my field, and yet I'm applying for that place in the conference, I'm going to get that keynote, no matter what. <laughs> Although I know that guy there is better, but I'll go for it. And I think we can allow ourselves sometimes also like, not to be always perfect, but to go with what we have, because it's already great. Um, and yeah, allow ourselves also, you know, like, like everybody else, to sometimes, you know, not to meet the deadline, but rather have that coffee and, uh, you know, like um, have another great opportunity coming out of that because um, it's so hard to get that resources like time and money to actually also really shape your career. 
That's really good. That's right. I just want to say that also internally, um, there's a lot of burden on, on women to solve the issue, the, the issue around women scientists. And, and so there's, there is that. It's OK to say no to things, not to be on every board. It is everyone's issue. Because um, you hear that a lot, the fatigue. Mm. Fatigue that uh, women feel as they rise to prominence, that they're asked to be on every single committee. I, you hear this a lot at, at universities, right? Take in engineering faculties. I, I bet, I bet. Um, yeah. And it, it, yeah. A, a, a very inspirational mentor of mine um, always talks about um, when, when they're asked to do something and they're really interested to do it, they have to, they have to stop doing something else. And that really helps them make the decision, you know, do I really want to do this? Or, or actually, am I, is what I'm already doing still really, really front and centre of, of where my energy is? And I think that's not always the right decision, obviously. To, sometimes it's good to take something else on as well. But that sort of mindset of being strategic, you know, I've, I've got all these things, this is a new opportunity, I'd love to do that. OK, how do I make that happen? rather than just keep on taking on and on and on. And, and as you say, the, the burnout and the, um, the, the situations where it becomes unsustainable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know when I've sorted that one out in my own life <laughs> and get back to you. <laughs> I think we have some more questions. Yeah, thanks a lot um, for the nice discussion so far. My name is Jess Roman, based here in Berlin, and um, I just had two questions for from both of you. First of all, regarding editors of journals, so we see uh, in a lot of a lot of well-established journals these legacy editors who have been editors mm -hmm. for a very long time, and of course in fields where maybe we have a lot of women up and coming, um, but still the editors of the journals are are very male. I wonder if something like a term limit would make a lot of sense, that someone stays in the editorial position maybe for four years, five years, and then it is given to another individual or having some kind of shared governance where it rotates among a team of editors just to get some of those new voices, um, which also bring new methodological expertise. Uh, towards the tops of the journal. So that's my first question. And second question is about peer review. I'm wondering if you have any um, numbers regarding uh, the burden, let's say, of peer review among women compared with men, uh, who's actually doing those peer reviews, which, as you mentioned, is kind of the unsung hero role, because it's usually not compensated or recognized formally by institutions. If there's any movement within journals to not only recognize that in terms of crediting, but compensating for time, or even part of a position, really that role being recognized as part of my job formally. Thanks. Thank you for that question. Maybe I can just, we have um, a wonderful colleague within Elsevier, Bahar Memani, and she is our peer review expert. So I'm going to put you in touch with her. Um, there are many different ex you know, ex experimentations per journal around. Um, so, and I know that she was working on a whole reviewer appreciation certification kind of uh, program. But I can't tell you the specifics. And I do believe they're baking in term limits now with editors. And I, I just want to mention an example. So uh, Richard Horton is the editor of The Lancet, the editor in chief. And two years ago, at the start of the pandemic, when the IND advisory board was formed, he's the, he's the chair, the co chair with our, our CEO. And he basically wrote to all these older male editors, and um, in, in an engagement-driven letter, but you know it's coming from Richard Horton, who's kind of a superstar, um, he, uh, he asked them to, you know, for, for all of these reasons to consider stepping down and making space for a, a woman editor. And all of them, but one, said yes. And so he was able to, in one fell swoop, move his general <laughs> editorial board to 50%. Um, so and, you know, even that's, you know, that's quite amazing. I think um, Cell Press has taken a slightly different approach. But it, I think term limits is the way to go. Yeah. And the, the, the key thing is vigilance, right? It's got, to, it's got to be embedded. Otherwise, it will peter out. It's like you can have whole initiatives to make sure awards and research grants are given to men and women equi equitably. But if there's no <coughs> spotlight on it, it's just going to go right back to where it was. But. Uh, but I, I will put you, we'll touch base afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, thank you. 
Okay, um, thank you very much. My name is Marianne Moridi from the University of Nairobi in Kenya. And um, I, quest I have two questions, one for, for you, Ruth, and the other one to you, Elaine. Um, so for Ruth, uh, I would just like you to tell me, uh, in my situation, I was recently made a head of department where, in, in my department, there are, of course, more male, more professors, so and they somehow have to answer to someone a bit younger. We have term limits, so and, and that's how that came about. So I, I, I've seen from you and what you've also shared your experience, you seem to be in a similar field, which I'm, I'm assuming they're more male and more, let's say, um, uh, uh, more qualified, no, not more qualified, but uh, more experienced, and they probably have to answer to you. How do you... Um, um, share and how do you, I'm, I'm trying to find the right word, um, find a way to communicate to them and um, not have them look down upon you? Because sometimes I, I'm normally sailing in the boat of, uh, should I tell them what to do? And uh, if I tell them, how are they going to perceive me? And I still need them for mentorship and for me also to rise up in my academic career, and I'm sure even for you. Uh, so probably I, I would like to hear more of your experience in that. And then also you mentioned um, something about um, scientists coming from the lower middle income countries and how to have our voices heard and um, uh, our ideas also shared amongst the table and maybe also get some uh, uh, great opportunities that we may not really get a chance to do that. And uh, I'd like to probably hear more on uh, the opportunities that um, LCV has uh, created and also fall in walls so that I can also probably share back with my colleagues because sometimes we feel our voices are not heard and particularly being women in a very male-dominated culture and also world and field, it's, it's, we have to work 10 times harder to have our voices heard. So probably would like to hear more on tips that you have for, uh, for, for us. Thank you, I hope I made sense. Amazing questions. Oh, I'm just mindful of time, so please, could, would you mind addressing um, the second I question? I was going to suggest yeah. that you answer this yeah. first about oh. how do you manage and, you know, uh, all those senior male colleagues that you're now in a pos leadership position around, because I think that's big. That's, but I'm very happy to... Uh, I'm, I, mean, I, can, I can do a, a short version, and then I'd love to sort of carry on the conversation afterwards. Um, I, think, I, I just first want to say congratulations. I think that's the most amazing thing that you're... <laughs> you're leading your department and it sounds an incredibly difficult position also an incredibly exciting one that the opportunities you're going to have to to influence and to set trajectories and to pave the ways for people who are coming through I, I think that's really wonderful and but I, I say that knowing it must be one of the, a, a very heavy heavy load um, and I guess I, I I feel like a complete imposter now <laughs> because um, I haven't taken on those formal management roles and the roles that I have um, have been um, more strategic and, and working collaboratively with, 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 with senior colleagues. So my, I, I, just, I don't feel qualified in any way to, to, to advise you um, on that particular situation. I would say that um, in my experience, showing up is really important yeah. um, bringing energy and bringing bringing vision and bringing belief is important um, i think people respect that and i think people can see that when you have a vision and you have energy to put into it and you have a collegial approach that good things are, are possible um, i would also say that there'll be some people you will never be able to win over um, and you could put 90% of your energy into that and probably won't leave you particularly enthused and it might not get you the result that you're hoping for. Um, so in general, one of the things I've, um, I've found to be a positive way of moving forward is to go where the energy is. Okay, so those that get it, align with them, work with them, build consensus with them and then often others follow. But, but find your allies, find the people who get it, who, who are on the same page, who are inspired by your vision, who would love to contribute to your vision and work together. That's, that's been something that's helped me. 
but let's talk more um, offline for sure. Sorry, please ask with the no, second no, question. No, um, no, <laughs> it's a very big question that you asked Marianne about uh, develop, you know, uh, developing country researchers and opportunities and I, um, so I feel I'll just, maybe I'll just start and give you, you know, share um, some thoughts and then we can continue in the break and as well. But um, what came top of mind again to me was the next Einstein Forum. So for those who aren't familiar with it, it uh, formed, was it four years ago? No, it's longer than that because of the pandemic. But um, it, it is meant to be a, um, a, a multidisciplinary conference uh, festival, a bit like the Euroscience Open Forum, if you're familiar with that, or the AAAS. Uh, and, and they had a, a conference in Senegal and Rwanda. Uh, it was um, the launch of it was funded by the Robert Bosch Foundation, so uh, Germany was really there as one of the very first kind of supporters. Um, we supported, we worked with Falling Walls to found Scientific African, and that is a, an online mega journal across every single discipline area, and the goal was, and we did this in Rwanda um, so four years ago now, uh, but the whole goal was to have an African-driven journal that um, with very, very low APCs, I think it was 200 when we launched or so per, per article, because that's always an issue with um, ensuring that open access journals are as accessible as subscription journals. Um, so that is still going strong. And Elsevier has basically supported all of the infrastructure and, and the capacity building. But it's, it's, it's really the whole idea was to support pan-African collaboration uh, and visibility um, and provide an, an additional space for, for getting that research out there because so much research in, in um, lower income countries often will go into unindexed journals. And you know, so I, I think that's a good initiative. But I, I think something that's critical is just the, the opportunities to present, to be visible in, in your field. And so with, the, with the, the pandemic, we had many more online. And I, you know, I think conferences do try to make space for this much more, I think, of our own conference series than they did in the past. So it, it really is worth putting forward your ideas as a speaker, a poster, whatever the, the um, pitching. But this is just a very partial answer. You know, I think um, you know, if there's, for instance, an editorial board you want to be a part of, a journal that you, you know, this is really your field, you can always write to the, the, the editor, the publisher. I don't know how visible that is, but for instance, every elsewhere journal has a journal homepage. And then you can find out who the editor and the publisher are and the, uh, all, everything, who's all on there. And you can write to them and say, I would really like to be involved and maybe... You know, they, if you're not um, at that senior level yet, maybe there's a way you can... Um, yeah, suggesting a special issue yeah. often a is a really issue. good way. Um, <laughs> Hear it from the academics. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, identifying a really timely topic um, you know, that's in your area where you know some really good people. Um, I think if you can present it as not only an excellent topic, but also bringing diversity of voice, yeah. most journal editors would bite your arm off. <laughs> yeah. and, and then, and then that's, a ne that's a step in and you can that's right. make progress there. Uh, I also wanted to note that Elizabeth is a huge you know, <laughs> treasury of, of ideas and information, has co-convened 22 gender summits now, and um, two of them in Africa, one in South Africa, one in Rwanda, um, but also working with the Next Einstein Forum, for instance, but also in Latin America. So that's also interesting for those from, from Latin America. Um, but you, you know, you you have a lot of advice on how to to um, how you work with your your speakers <coughs> and how they might go about it, and um, so I just I just point her out to you. Just <laughs> <laughs> I think we're out of time, Ilan. Thank you so much for being so open and sharing your experiences and insights. Um, I think you'll agree it's, we've started off in such a really positive. <laughs> positive way um so so thank you so much my pleasure and i, I really it's a, pl a pleasure talking to you you're oh, such a good uh, we could go on for <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you come back on saturday well yeah we'll but, but it, also yeah. just an honor i mean i feel honored honored to be here and, and honored to to be a part of this uh, wonderful initiative so program mm. I say. <laughs> so thank you and um, thank you <laughs>